What's up everybody? My name is Ronnie Joseph Lovovsky. Uh, I am a cookbook author. Uh, I am a food blogger. I'm the creator of a food blog called Primal Gourmet and I am absolutely stoked to be here with you today. We're talking all things Thanksgiving. I know what you're thinking. If you're in the, if you're in the States, you're thinking Thanksgiving in October. Here in Canada, we celebrate uh, Thanksgiving this coming Monday. I can't remember the date exactly. I think it's the 8th or the 7th. My brain is all over the place. I've been cooking turkey all day long, so I've lost track of date and time. Uh, so we're talking all things Canadian Thanksgiving, and uh, it's really, it's an honor for me to be here with you today. It's really a joy and a privilege. I am a, a, such, a, such a fan of Traeger grills in general, not just the grills themselves, which I've been cooking on personally for about three or four years now. Uh, it's all I cook on outdoors, and but more so the community like like many of you who are watching i consider myself as part of the trigger hood and it's a great community to be a part of it's very very welcoming and everybody shows a lot of love when you're cooking on your trigger and it's all about you know keeping it very fun and light and feeding your family really delicious food so for me personally it's really special to be here because every single thanksgiving since I've gotten my Traeger, I've cooked Thanksgiving dinner on it. Uh, so what I'm showing you today is obviously lots of smoke rolling already. Um, that's still good. Uh, we're going to be showing you something I make pretty much every year. Uh, some spins on traditional dishes like we've got our sweet potatoes in there. We've got our turkey with a couple of like fun uh, moderations or, or modifications rather that are, I think, really tasty very very simple uh, really really available for wherever you are so you'll be able to get most of these ingredients anywhere uh, nothing really specialty here maybe one or two specialty items but those are easily available either uh, online or at a specialty market and we'll talk all about that today so I'm stoked to be here with you today I want to thank everybody for joining me um, we've got about an hour together so settle in grab a drink get comfortable and also feel free to type in any kind of questions you've got as we're cooking along uh, I've got my cameraman here Colin on the ones and twos the Traeger team is behind the scenes we're all here ready and prepared to answer your questions if you've got them fire them away and then we'll find some time in between the recipe to answer those and you know talk a little bit back and forth uh, so what we've got today are a smoked spatchcock turkey. If you've never done a spatchcock turkey uh, or you don't know what that means, we're going to talk all about it. I'm going to tell you why I personally love it. It's the only way I cook turkey since I've done it. Um, it is by far, I think, the top, top, top solution, especially if you're uh, doing a lot of things at once like I tend to do. It cuts down time and whatnot. We're doing a beautiful whole roasted cauliflower, which is a recipe from my cookbook. Uh, that cookbook is called the Primal Gourmet Cookbook. This is an adapted version. So everything is done on the Traeger. And uh, that cookbook is available everywhere books are sold, in case you're wondering. And lastly, we're doing a charred sweet potato with a whipped feta, uh, some bomba, which is a delicious Calabrian chili oil from Italy, uh, and some herbs, and it's gonna be amazing this is some these are some of my favorite things to eat and to cook so i'm really excited to co start cooking with you guys a couple things before we get going i'm rocking on two grills today you do not need two grills for this you can do everything on one obviously if you have a trigger you know this already to be true i've got a pro 780 uh cranked up to 225 not really cranked up but rolling at 225 Fahrenheit. And I've got a Timberline 1300 rolling, uh, just heating up now, but it's gonna get up to 500 Fahrenheit. We're gonna do the vegetables on the Traeger, on the, sorry, on the Timberline 1300. And we're gonna do the turkey on the Pro 780. Uh, obviously, doesn't matter which Traeger you've got, you'll be able to do this on any of them. Uh, and the beauty of this is really everything gets cooked on the Traeger. You don't need to rely on anything else. Um, and also, you can do a lot of the stuff ahead of time. So if you've got a lot of family coming over, or you've got a big friends or big friends giving that's uh, being planned, you can do a lot of the stuff ahead of time as long as you give yourself that time to do it. 
what else we need are some turkey pellets. I don't know if you can see it down there in the corner, but we've got some turkey blend pellets, which are really, really great. It's a blend of some delicious woods. Uh, and then in each turkey blend pack of pellets, it comes with a turkey brine kit. This is a, such a lifesaver. It's a ready to go brine kit. We're gonna talk all about brines um, and also a spice rub. I kid you not, I've got a turkey that's already done. I have never made a turkey that looks this good. It's epic. So these come ready to go in your turkey, brand, uh, your turkey blend pellets. So grab a bag of those now if you can, uh, especially if you're in Canada. You know, Monday is Friday today. Monday is coming up real quick. So get out, uh, get to your local retailer, your local stockist, uh, or check out the, the Traeger, Traeger site. Maybe they can deliver it to you, but this is a real game changer. They're super, super flavorful, really, really convenient. And we'll show you how to go with those. And then the other things we need, aside from the grills, the pellets, obviously, the brine kit, um, is a meat thermometer. If you want a really great turkey and you don't want to stress, I highly, highly, highly recommend you get a thermometer. I'm using a meter plus. These things are next level. Um, they attach, so they uh, pair with your smartphone and you get all kinds of readings on there. So you'll get, uh, you can set a target temperature. You can get ambient temperature readings all to your phone. And the, the really cool thing about the Meter Plus is it gives you an estimated cook time. So it calculates the ambient temperature, the target temperature, and then the temperature inside of the meat or protein you're cooking. And it'll calculate automatically a target cook time. So, or sorry, an estimated cook time of say two hours, three hours, an hour and a half, and then it'll send you notifications for when your food is ready to come off the grill. It's super, super interesting and convenient and useful. So if you don't have a meter plus, get one. I highly recommend them. It takes a big, it takes a lot of guesswork out of cooking a turkey because as probably we all know, if you overcook a turkey, it's a sad, sad day. There isn't really much going back after that. Uh, so you definitely don't want to overcook it and dry it out. And having a great meat thermometer is ideal and clutch for that. So definitely have that handy. And I should mention also that for the vegetables, for the roast cauliflower and the sweet potato, I'm using some apple pellets. You can use any kind of pellets for the, for the vegetables. And even, you know what, you can use the turkey pellets as well, especially if you're cooking on just one grill. I don't think there's really a need to swap them out, especially because you're cooking the vegetables at a higher temperature. So you have less smoke delivery. Um, you won't get as much nuance in the flavor. You'll just get a really delicious wood fired flavor on the vegetables that you won't get otherwise. So any type of pellet works for the vegetables. If you want a different pellet for the turkey, you can use a cherry wood or um, an apple wood uh, or a pecan, something softer, not too heavy personally don't like uh, a mesquite or a hickory. It's a little bit heavy in terms of the smoke flavor, uh, but an apple or a cherry works really, really well if you don't have the turkey blend pellets. All right, so we're just gonna get started. Uh, first thing we've gotta do is get to work on our turkeys. And you'll see, I'm putting on some gloves here. You don't gotta put on gloves, but I'm cooking outside, as you can tell. Uh, did I mention I'm, I'm in Toronto? Uh, so. We're here in Toronto, Canada. We got really, really lucky today. Uh, it's October. I'm wearing shorts. It is a beautiful, beautiful day. It was supposed to rain. It didn't rain. The, the Traeger gods have blessed us with a, a beautiful day to cook. So here I have a raw turkey. All right. I have... grain-fed, Mennonite-raised, uh, pasture-raised turkey. It is about as good as it gets when it comes to turkeys. It was slaughtered on Tuesday. I picked it up on Wednesday. It's super fresh. And this is really, really important because if you're gonna pick a bird, I highly recommend you get it from a local source, from someone who is raising them uh, humanely. The flavor is better. It's better for the environment. And also you're supporting local farmers 
and local butcher, butchers. If you can't get it farm fresh or farm direct, head to your local butcher. Uh, I got all my all my turkeys from my local butcher, um, and they're great. Like you can't be beat. Um, the Im other important thing is everybody wants a showstopper turkey on Thanksgiving. You really, I think, don't need a huge, huge bird. Uh, I would rather personally get two 12 pounders than one 24 pounder. And the reason for that is I find that the smaller birds have a more concentrated flavor or a better flavor. They're a little bit less gamey or tough in texture. Uh, and also they're just easier to handle. Like you don't need a humongous brining vessel for a smaller bird. And I'll show you some ideas and uh, tips for how to brine the bird uh, also. So if you can get a smaller bird, get a smaller bird. Now we are going to spashcock, but before we do that, obviously turkeys normally will come with the giblets inside. So you'll get some things like some organ meats, some offal, like maybe some kidneys or some livers, uh, maybe the butt, which is uh, pure fat, maybe a heart and also a neck. Don't throw these out. I, I urge you not to throw them out. Put them in your stock to make gravy. Uh, you'll get so much flavor out of them um, or just keep them for any kind of stock in general, like make a turkey stock with this and then make a turkey stock with the bones after you've done smoking and roasting the bird. It's super, super delicious, and the flavor of that smokiness will come through, and it's going to give you a lot of, a lot of, a lot of flavor. So set these aside. Don't toss them. I really, really like them, and also when you don't toss them, nothing goes to waste. So we've got a bird here that is ready to be spatchcocked. Spatchcocking, if you aren't familiar with it or if you've never heard about it, literally refers to removing the backbone and butterflying the bird. So as you can see, we've got a whole turkey here. Um, what we want to do is we want to remove this backbone entirely. And this too, just like the giblets and the neck, we're going to set aside for a homemade stock and a homemade gravy. Now, this is going to give you a lot of flavor. So don't toss this. It's very valuable. You can also do what I sometimes call a half spatchcock, where you just spatchcock one side and keep the other side intact. So here's what we're going to do. You got two options. <clears throat> one, you can grab a pair of kitchen shears. I personally am not crazy about kitchen shears. They're really awkward. And as you can see, I've got to push down really hard to get on it. So to cut through the bone, you can do it this way. I don't like it. <laughs> I'm going to show you an easier way. You're going to get a very sharp knife. <clears throat> you want to make sure that the knife is something that is both sharp and also durable. So if you're using something like this guy, which is a really, really thin Japanese blade, not for that, not for this, uh, get something that is really heavy duty and sharp. And all we're going to do is we're going to set the Turkey on its neck. We've got a stable base now. And we're going to take our knife and we're going to we're going to make an incision and cut through downwards like this. And you'll see it happens really, really simply and easily. I don't need much force. And all of a sudden I've got one part of the turkey backbone uh, open and ready to go. So now same thing with the other one. Very carefully grabbing the knife really firmly and making sure we've got a good hold of the turkey in general. We're just going to slowly slide down the turkey. You don't need much force. As you can see, you're going to let the knife do the work. And then once you get down here, you may need to just finagle the knife a little bit, just so you can get through this section here, just like that. Simple. So we've removed the backbone and that's pretty much it. We've got one more step. And the other step is we just want to put the, put the bird breast side down. And you'll see here in the middle, there's a breast plate. And in order for us to butterfly the bird, we just want to make a little incision and then crack it open just like that. And now we can flatten the bird. 
turkeys have a very thick membrane here. So I'm just going to score this and that's going to just free up the bird a little bit, make it a little bit more pliable. If you've got a little bit of skin connecting there for when they pack the bird, you can do that. And then if you've got like a little piece of bone poking out here, you can just butcher that off ever so gently, like so. There you go. All right, so we've got our bird spatchcocked. And why, why do this? Like, why go through the trouble? Sir? One question? That was one of the questions. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I, I inadvertently answered a question without knowing the question was even posed. So why spatchcock? A few reasons. One, by doing this, I've exposed more skin. Skin is delicious. <laughs> And I want crispy skin. I want as much browning on the skin as possible. If you're roasting the bird whole, this whole bottom side is never going to see the light of day. Uh, and it might not get as much color on the bottom. Uh, if you're doing it in a Traeger, actually, the, the upside of doing it in a Traeger is because you're grilling it, basically, the heat is going to penetrate from the bottom. But the last thing you want to do is throw this in like a roasting pan and roast it whole on the bottom. And the bottom doesn't get any caramelization, no color, no flavor. It just becomes soggy, uh, rubbery skin. So by doing this, you've exposed more flesh, uh, more skin. The other reason is essentially you've cut down your cooking time by like at least an hour and a half. No longer do you have to worry about cooking the interior cavity of the bird. Everything is flat, uniform, and will cook much more quickly and evenly. Uh, last but not least, the, one of the reasons I personally like spatchcocking is because it's way easier to carve after it's done cooking. And I'll show you how to do that at the end when we start carving the bird. So we've got a beautiful turkey here um, that is ready to be brined. So we're gonna build our brine now. Someone asked, what we got a question. Sorry, say again? What do I do if my turkey is pre-brined? What do you do if your turkey is pre-brined? If your turkey is pre-brined, I would say you can still go ahead with spatchcocking it after you've gotten it home. Depending on the type of brine that it's in and who's brined it, you may want to rinse that brine off. Um, I would not purchase a turkey that has been brined for more than 24 hours. And the reason for that is once you go above 24 hours or longer than 24 hours, the texture of the meat just becomes a little bit rubbery and you enter this kind of rubbery zone where the, the, the flavor of the meat and the texture does not taste good. So if you're going to brine or you're going to get something that's brined, make sure that it's only been brined for 24 hours or less. Um, not even less, I would say at least 24 hours, but no longer than that. Uh, but then you can also take it home, do everything, pat it dry, uh, and then spatchcock it and proceed to the next step. That's totally fine. So what we've got to do here is build our brine. And I've got some gloves, some extra gloves, so I just don't want to cross contaminate everything. So you'll see me switching in and out of gloves here. For our brine, I need some hot water. So I've got one quart of water here that has obviously been boiling and to this I'm going to add the brine package or the brine part of the brine pack. So each pack of brine kit comes with a brine and rub. You want to make sure that you're using the brine part for this. So as you can see this is what comes with the uh, turkey pellet grubs. You can also buy this individually. I don't know if I mentioned that, but this can be purchased individually as well. So this is the rub, this uh, paprika red delicious seasoning pack, and this is the brine. So you're going to empty the contents of the brine into one quart of boiling water. We'll pretend this is boiling. 
Obviously, I don't have a burner out here, but you'll get the picture just the same. It works identically. And then we're going to let that essentially dissolve. That's hot. <laughs> it's not really hot, but it's hot. Opa. So we're just going to let this dissolve. We're going to give it a little whiskey whisk. And already it smells, oh, it smells incredible. You've got orange peel in here. You've got a bunch of herbs, spices. There's some uh, salt. There's a tiny bit of sugar. Um, and it is really, really tasty stuff. When it comes to brining in general, you've got two options. You can do something called a wet brine, which is what we're doing here. But you can also do a dry brine. They work the same. A dry brine essentially means seasoning your bird with some kind of salty mixture. Um, you can season the bird like this with this, dry, uh, this brine kit. You can just take the seasoning and just spread it all over the bird. Put it in your fridge overnight. Uh, I've done this many times. It is really, really delicious. Um, and, not, and skip and forego the entire wet process. So you don't need any water whatsoever. That's an option. The other option is to do the wet brine as we're doing it here. And the reason in general why you want to brine your bird... Sorry, we've got a plane over top of our heads. The reason why you want to brine your bird in general, and this is something I highly, highly recommend no matter what, whether you're doing a dry brine or a wet brine, is for two reasons. One, we want to impart the bird with flavor, and flavor comes through the vessel of salt. So this is not to get too scientific-y, but uh, this happens through reverse osmosis. So some of that salt water solution is going to penetrate into the bird as it brines overnight in the fridge, and it's going to deliver flavor. So the salt is going to carry with it all of the orange peel and the peppercorns and the herbs and the sugar and the salt. Um, and then at the same time, it's going to basically give you like an insurance policy against the dry bird because as you cook the bird all of the moisture stays within the turkey so whether you're doing a chicken whether you're doing a turkey whether you're doing a quail or a pheasant or any kind of fowl or poultry a brining solution is a great idea to prevent against drying out the bird um, and the last thing you want again is a is a dry turkey so we've got this brine here that's nice and mixed and dissolved. And now we need to figure out a vessel. Like where do we put this turkey? We've got a couple options, okay? You can do this in a big bucket, whatever big bucket you've got. Um, it could be in a stock pot that's big enough to hold the bird and enough liquid to fully submerge it. It could be in a roasting dish. Let's say you've got a humongous roasting dish. In fact, I brined one of my turkeys in uh, one of those aluminum roasting dishes that you can find at uh, the dollar store or like a, 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 a grocery store, one of those big like aluminum tin foil or tin uh, roasting dishes. That worked. And the beauty is because it's spatchcocked, it lays flat. You can brine it in a variety of different vessels. For us, we're going to do it in this bucket. This is, <laughs> you're gonna laugh. This is just a bucket from the dollar store that you would use to like clean your house. It's, I've washed it with a lot of soap and water. It's perfectly clean. That's the big, big important thing. Make sure it's really, really clean before you use it for any kind of food related thing. But essentially it's just a tub that you're gonna put your turkey in. What I recommend is whatever you get, make sure you can fit it in your fridge. Another option is to do it in a cooler. So if you've got a big cooler, either a styrofoam one or a big cooler, whatever the brand is, you can do it in there. If you've got a 25, 30 pounder turkey, that's probably the best place to do it because it's really big and it'll fit. Um, but something like this, as you'll see in a second, is perfect. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dump this mixture this brining solution into the bucket, like so. <clears throat> and then we want to basically dilute it. So I've got one quart of water with the brining solution, a brining uh, mix, and I'm gonna add three quarts of water, cold water. 
that's going to go in so that we have obviously enough water to cover the turkey. It doesn't matter how much water you have, as long as it covers the turkey, you want the turkey to be fully submerged. And it's very important that you let this liquid cool down before you add the turkey because if you just pop it in there, you're going to start cooking the turkey. It's hot water. So one trick is to just fill it up with some ice and be careful here because it'll obviously splatter everywhere. So you've got your ice in there. You've got your brining solution. You've got your water. And now we just need to get our turkey. So I've got some gloves. And I'm going to submerge the turkey breast side down. The reality is the breast is going to dry out potentially more than any other part of the meat. All right. So as long as the breast is down, you're good. The, the thighs and the legs have a little bit more of a buffer in terms of cook time and dryness because they have a lot more fat. So that's ready to go. This you've got to pop in the fridge for 24 hours or overnight. So let's say overnight to 24 hours. So minimum brining time, I recommend eight hours. No longer than 24 or as mentioned, you enter into that kind of like rubbery turkey uh, texture zone and we don't want that. So I'm going to put this aside here. It's cold. It's great. We have any questions? All right. So we're going to keep going here. I'm going to set this aside and I'm going to ask Colin to give me the brined bird here. Thank you, Colin. So we've got one that's ready to go already. Man, this is time is flying. All right, let's move quick. All right, we've got a turkey that's already brined. It's dried. It's been sitting out at room temperature for about an hour. Uh, which is important because we want the turkey to cook as an even unit so everything is one temperature. And what we're going to do is we're going to build our compound butter. So I've got here, actually, I've got to make some room here. There we go. Give me a second here. All right. I've got here some herbs. I've got some parsley, some rosemary, some thyme, and some sage. And we're going to build a really simple compound butter. For the sage, I'm just going to take off the lower stems. The upper stems are fine. The soft ones are perfectly edible. And same thing with the parsley. All right. Now I'm going to essentially roll this all up and we're going to chop it up really finely. You can do this in a food processor as well. No problem. But while I'm chopping this, Colin, we got any questions from the audience? Someone says, how do I get crispier skin on a turkey? All right. So we'll talk about that. And that's one of the things that we're going to do in this recipe here. And if you're going to start off with smoking the bird, I definitely recommend kicking it up or kicking up the heat at the end to finish, which is exactly what we're going to be doing here. And that's going to render out some fat and that's going to crisp up the skin. So you'll see at the end of this, I'm going to show you a truly beautiful crispy skin turkey. You won't believe your eyes. Where's my bowl for the butter? should have had a clear glass bowl here with the oh you know what I use this one all right so we've got here some all of our herbs chopped up so we've got the rosemary thyme sage um, and rosemary thyme sage and parsley I've got some beautiful grass-fed butter here that's room temperature if you want something that um, is not 
well, technically not dairy free, but less dairy, for example, you can use ghee. This is ghee. It is essentially butter that has been cooked down to the point where the dairy solids can be removed. So it's 99% dairy free, virtually dairy free, not entirely because it's obviously made from butter itself. But it's a great option if you want to keep things paleo or whole 30. If you follow either of those protocols, um, you can use ghee instead of butter. I'm using butter just for the sake of using butter, to be honest. And all of these ingredients and measurements uh, can be found on the Traeger site. So if you go to traeger.com slash recipes, you'll find all of the ingredients for these recipes there. You'll find the times and measurements, etc. So all we've got to do here it was we just got to mix this around and we're going to form a compound butter maybe while i'm doing this do we got any questions from the audience any other questions which, which is better uh better uh which brine is better dry or wet you know it really it, oh yeah so the question was uh which option is better a dry brine or a wet brine and to be honest, both are good. You can do either or. A wet brine just requires a, a bigger vessel, so you need something to put the turkey in as you brine it. A dry brine, you can brine flat. Um, so if you have, say, like let's say you're living in an apartment and you don't have a lot of room in a fridge or an extra fridge, for example, um, then a dry brine could be a bit more beneficial because you have a bit more room in the fridge for it versus a wet brine where you need something that could like a fridge that could hold a bucket like that which is not every kind of fridge i you know i lived in a condo for a little while so i know that not all fridges are created equally in terms of size so a dry brine could be a great option in terms of flavor they work the same it's all through reverse osmosis you really don't get that big of a difference from one or the other um, and then the benefit of having a dry brine is you don't have to worry about drying out the the turkey like I have it here when it's time to cook because it's already dry um, so you could just cook the turkey like this with the with the rub it'll be delicious for extra flavor what you want to do and what I like to do you obviously don't have to do this but I like it is you're just gonna take your hand and you're gonna create a pocket of air between the breast meat and the skin all right, so you can see it doesn't take much effort. You're just gonna go in there with your hand, almost like giving the you know turkey a little massage. Give a little massage, like that. Free up some space there, and then you take your compound butter. I'm gonna put some aside here, like so. And here's what you do: you take a little bit at a time, and you just pop it in there, and you spread it out over top so don't try to smoosh it all in there uh, from underneath it's really really tough so instead you're just going to take the butter and you're going to smoosh it and spread it around <clears throat> excuse me in between the breast and the skin you could also go down into the thighs if you want for sake of time i'm not going to show that to you today i think you get the picture here but it's as easy as that. And the re again, the reason we're doing this is for more flavor and also to prevent the breast from drying out because dry turkey breast is not delicious. We want delicious, juicy, succulent meat with a crispy skin, lots of smoke and wood-fired flavor. Um, well, not even lots of smoke and wood-fired flavor, I lie. It's a, like a, a beautiful wood-fired flavor. Salted or unsalted butter? Ah, great question. Salted or unsalted butter? As a rule of thumb, I always cook with unsalted butter. Uh, I don't buy salted butter because I would rather control the amount of butter myself. Uh, so I'll taste the, taste the butter and if it needs more salt, I'll add salt to it. But unsalted butter, especially if you're cooking um, with something that has salt in it, like the brine is salty, the rub is salty, so you really don't need salted butter here. And the next step is just to season the bird with the brine, um, the brine rub. And this stuff is so good. It's herby, it's salty, 
it's a it's garlicky it's really delicious and i'm a, i'm not a big fan of like pre-packaged spi uh, spices or rubs or sauces i tend to like to build them myself but everything from traeger is delicious if they always nail it they always do a great job in terms of favor profiles so this one is really great you're going to get that all over the bird you're going to do that under the bird as well one packet is plenty for um, a smaller bird like this a 12 pounder you may need another pack if you want a big bird that's ready to go that's it that's all you do we put it in a 225 225 traeger like so you can lay it horizontally and away from the back as much as possible so that you don't uh, accidentally char the wing that's going to go in your 225 traeger for about two hours oh i forgot one thing no i almost forgot the most important part we need to put the meter so we're going to take our probe this is the super important part because we need to know exactly what temperature we're at and this is going to let us know that so we take our meter take our gloves take our meter and i want to insert it into the breast the thickest part of the breast and the reason i want to insert into the breast as opposed to the thigh is for two reasons the thigh when spatchcocked cooks quicker than the breast you will always have a quicker cook on the thigh than the breast because you have a smaller piece of meat and there's less bone in between or on the outside so you take the meter we're going to lift the skin and we're going to go at a little bit of an angle and the great thing about this about the app the meter app is once you select a turkey option for the cook it's going to prompt you with a little video on how to correctly insert the probe so there's a little little uh, notch here and the important thing is you want the notch to be covered like so so you really don't want that notch exposed because you won't get an accurate reading otherwise so that's good to go now this is going to go back onto the grill and we're going to cook it for around two hours at 225 give or take every turkey is different every turkey is different in size every grill works a little bit differently every ambient temperature if you're doing this on a cold day will take longer than if you do it on a warm day so you just got to pay attention the reason why i love having a meat thermometer like the meter is because it'll tell you exactly how long it'll take uh, and really you're just going based off of off of cooking temperature not cooking time so it could take two hours could take two and a half hours it doesn't really matter as long as the temperature is set correctly so you want to cook it till it's about 110 Fahrenheit internally. Once it reaches 110 Fahrenheit internally in the breast, we're going to crank the heat up on the Traeger to 375 Fahrenheit. Anywhere between 375 and 400 is okay. And then we're going to carry on the cook until the internal temperature of the, the turkey reaches 163, 164, even 162 Fahrenheit. And then we're going to pull it off and we're going to let it rest. And we're going to let it rest so that the juices, the internal juices, redistribute throughout the meat. Otherwise, they're all going to come pouring out and you're going to be left with a little bit of a drier bird. Uh, any questions, Colin? I'm going to have a sip here before we get to the, the vegetable portion. Someone said, should um, you smoke the organs before using them for stock? So, oh, so the question is, should you smoke the, the giblets of the turkey? before using them for stock, is that correct? Um, yeah, you can. I would, I would probably not smoke them. Um, I would roast them, or I would just saute them along with the vegetables if you're doing like, if you're doing any kind of like homemade stock. Um, if you're roasting the vegetables first, or you're uh, sauteing the vegetables, I would do that along with the giblets for sure. So you definitely wanna cook them before. You can get some color on them. Um, that's great. But otherwise, not entirely necessary. Can I ask you, Colin, to please hand me the cutting board? Uh, 
All right, the rest is really easy breezy. Uh, could not be easier, in fact. Thank you, sir. Okay. For this part, we've just got some veggies to handle. And these come together really, really simply. First up, we got some sweet potatoes. I just got a couple here. You can use three, you can use four. I recommend going smaller size so they cook a little bit quicker. These are gonna go onto a 500 Fahrenheit grill. And I like to put, position them towards one of the perimeters. So the back or the front where the grill gets hottest. If you've cooked on your Traeger for a while now, you know that there are hot spots. The back or the front perimeter or even the edges are where it gets hottest. And you want these to char. These will cook between 35 and 45 minutes at 500. You just wanna cook them until they're black all over and fork tender in the middle. So these are gonna go on. Done. There's your veggie handle right there. The other thing we're gonna do is the roast cauliflower. I have a blanched cauliflower here. It's just been blanched in some salted water at a rolling boil for about 10 minutes. The reason I'm doing that is because I want, just like the turkey, to introduce some saltiness into the flesh of the vegetable, <clears throat> into the deep centers. If you were to just roast this on a grill, the exterior would get nice and charred, but the interior would be hard as a rock. And if you kept cooking it on the grill until the interior was soft, the in exterior would burn. So what you do is you just par cook it or par or blanch it in salt water, and then you pull it out. You let it be cool enough to handle. You drizzle it either with some olive oil, you could rub it with some ghee, you could rub it with some butter, all variations work. And then you're just gonna hit it with a little bit of salt on the exterior, okay? Just for some extra flavor. And this also we're gonna pop onto the grill at 500 Fahrenheit uh, until it's charred and blackened all over. And I'll show you exactly how that looks. So the, the cauliflower, unlike the sweet potatoes, can go in the center of the grill uh, because if it's towards one of the back or front perimeters, it could char on the uh, underside. And then I'm just going to pull this one off. I got my spatula here. And when it comes off, it is absolutely gorgeous. This is one of my absolute favorite things to cook to eat, to serve. I don't know if you can see that, but it's beautifully charred and crispy on the outside. It opens up like a flower. If you can get a cauliflower with the, uh, the leaves still on it, like a farm fresh one, it doesn't make for any better presentation. Like, or it, you won't get a better presentation than that. I leave the leaves on solely for the purpose of presentation because I just think it looks really cool and it's a beautiful roasted whole cauliflower. To finish, you can hit it with some extra virgin olive oil just to jazz things up a bit. Maybe a little bit more flaky salt. And you can serve it just like this. I kid you not, your family will go nuts for it. You can stick a knife in it, make it look really cool. You could hit this with all kinds of sauces, tahini, a hot chili oil like this one. In fact, you could do the exact same thing we're gonna do for the sweet potatoes with the cauliflower. So I'm gonna show you exactly how to do that. You would just replace the sweet potatoes with the cauliflower. So once the sweet potatoes are nice and charred through the magic of television, we have some here, you'll see that they're nice and blackened all over. They're super, super soft in the middle. Like you can just easily pierce them with a fork. That's how you want them. And then you'll let them rest a little bit once they come off the grill. And you'll just see they peel like, like a candy wrapper. And inside, it's literally like sweet, sweet, sweet potato candy. It's so, so good. They're delicious. They caramelize on the inside. Like, I don't know if you can see that color there, but they're super caramelized. They're super sweet and intensely flavored. Can you see that, Colin? Well, Colin can see it because he's sitting right here. What about the folks at home? Can the folks at home see it? P 
peels like nothing, super easy. You could prepare these ahead of time uh, and then reheat them before serving at the dinner table. And then what I like to do just to make them a little bit extra fancy and interesting is I like to get a platter and some whipped feta. Now this is really just feta cheese that has been pureed with some of the water that is that it's packed with. So if you've ever purchased uh, a tub or a little container of feta cheese, and then you've seen there's some water there. Don't toss that water. It's really salty and briny uh, and it's really delicious. And all you do is you just put the pieces of feta cheese into a food processor along with some of that water and you get this delicious, like look at this, it's almost like, like a yogurt in texture and it's super creamy and salty and delicious it's everything you love about feta cheese but made into this kind of cream if you can't find feta cheese where you are or maybe somebody in your family just doesn't like feta cheese for whatever reason you could use a thick greek yogurt you could use a labne which is like a greek yogurt that's further thickened um, or you could just omit it altogether and just go straight for the chili oil whatever you like but this served underneath onto a platter is really something special. Like just smooth it out however you want. There's no rhyme or reason. Someone asked what other cheeses might work for this. Okay, so somebody asked what other cheeses might work for the whipped feta instead. You could do a goat cheese. You're just going to need a lot of it. Um, goat cheese is a great option. That'll be really smooth and creamy. Um, in terms of flavor, Feta cheese, goat cheese, um, what else, what else, what else? Cream cheese would work. Um, even, you know what, if you want to, you can really play around with it. You can go ricotta. You can do some ricotta and whip that. That'll be good too. And then we just layer it and plate it however you like. You know, stack it up, play Jenga with it. It doesn't matter. It's good. It's going to be really tasty, right? like so. Set that aside. That's done. And then to finish, this is really like one of the secret ingredients. This is bomba. So bomba is a Calabrian chili oil. In it, you've got Calabrian chilies. You've got some mushrooms. You've got some eggplant. You've got some uh, sun-dried tomatoes, some green tomatoes, some artichokes, some mish mushrooms. It's like a chili oil on steroids it's delicious it's so so good you can find it at almost any italian market or the international aisle of a grocery store it's a it's not crazy spicy it's really flavorful spicy um so you know if you've got a young kid like me i got a two-year-old she doesn't really dig it so much but for you know like the teenagers or the adults or anyone that likes spice this is a great great option it's a little bit different it's absolutely beautiful, as you can see. And because we've got the oil, we don't need any extra olive oil. Just drizzle this stuff all around. I'm gonna ask substitution if you're dairy free for the cheese. So substitution tahini? for dairy free for the cheese. Yeah, tahini is a great option. So somebody asked, what is a substitution for the whipped feta if you're dairy free? Um, you could definitely do tahini and this kind of chili oil. You could do just straight chili oil. You could do a coconut yogurt. There's a recipe for coconut yogurt, coconut milk yogurt in my cookbook that is really, really easy and simple and delicious. That would work. So I would say coconut yogurt, even, you know what, in the States, not so much in Canada, but in the States, they have really, really great almond milk products. So you've got great almond milk uh, cream cheese that is like, tastes just like regular cream cheese that is delicious. Uh, so look out for those, uh, and then you can, you know, if you want, if you're not worried so much about paleo or Whole30, you could do um, some vegan cheeses. You know, if you want to go rock with vegan cheeses, rock with vegan cheeses. You know, you're the boss, applesauce. You got to eat it, right? So over top, we've got some fresh dill and some fresh mint, and the mint really just like brings this stuff to life. Really, really delicious. It's bright, it's fresh, uh, and it's beautiful. So not too much mint because mint is 
pretty powerful stuff. That's going to set aside. And last but not least, we have no salt except for the feta. So a little bit of flaky salt over top. And you can, you know, if you don't got flaky salt, you're not fancy like me, you know, you don't got flaky salt. You could use regular kosher salt. Um, something preferably that is a bit thicker because you get those beautiful crystals on top that is like a pop of salty crunch that is really, really special. So look at this. We've got two recipes down already uh, and a couple minutes to spare. <laughs> so sweet potatoes are good to go. We got cauliflower that's good to go. The only thing that's left is the gobble gobble turkey. So we need to get our turkey out here. My man Colin is going to hit me up with a cooked turkey right now. Thank you, sir. Oh man, this stuff is so good. I could eat this stuff by the spoon. Thank you, my friend. I'm getting pretty excited here. Let's make a little bit of room just so we don't knock anything over. All right. All right. Okay. There we go. All right, here we go. I like how I had to put cooked. I marked cooked on it so Colin would know exactly which, <laughs> which foil packet to ban me. <laughs> da, 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 da. Oh, here we go. We got a... Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Look at that. Beauty. We got the meter in there. We're going to pop that out. We don't need that anymore. That's done its job. We're going to get a knife nice and clean so that we can carve this baby up. Any questions from the audience, Colin? Someone asked how long you cooked the cauliflower for. Great question. I completely forgot. Uh, the cauliflower will cook for about 40 minutes. And again, if you missed anything in terms of... Um, temperatures or times or ingredients you can head to traegergrills.com or sorry traeger.com slash recipes or all of the recipes are on the traeger app <clears throat> and also if you want to come back and revisit this video at another time uh, it'll be on the traeger app as well and save to the youtube and facebook channels so to carve we're going to separate first this is really difficult i don't know how to sh show it on camera but we're just going to slice down at an angle that's parallel to the direction of the breast here all right so you see this it's almost like it's telling you where to cut like so right and it should slice pretty easy you might encounter some bones but you know if you got a sharp knife don't worry about it there you go Oh my goodness. All right, so those we're going to do like this. We're gonna put it here. The easiest way to carve the thigh from the drumstick is to imagine like this is one line and you're making an X like so, okay? So the joint runs this way and you should be able to just slice right through it like so. Beautiful, beautiful smoke color super juicy oh my gosh look at this wow 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 and you got that crispy skin there and look at all this beautiful juicy melted butter we got some of that going we got that one done we're gonna set that aside for the breast set this aside for the breast so we'll make sure that doesn't fall over. We're going to go straight down the center. All right. The breastbone here, the breastplate, is way tougher on a turkey than a bird or chicken. So what we want to do is we want to just kind of follow the line of the meat from the breastplate at an angle. So the incisions I'm making are like so. All right. Like so. And then, you know what, people are going to, I feel like people at home are going to be like, this guy's not wearing gloves. Who's going to eat that stuff? His hands are all over it. So I'm going to put on some gloves for you. 
to be honest, it's just my family eating this stuff. So I, they have no problem with me touching the food. But obviously, if you've got like, you know, friends coming over, you might want to put on some gloves for this part. The easiest way to separate after this point is to use your hands. And the reason why is because around this point, you come at this kind of like intersection where the bird, the meat lifts up a bit away from the breastplate. And the way you get as much of that meat off of the bone as possible is just by running your fingers like so. And just moving away, moving it away from the breastplate and that big piece of cartilage. Once you get to around here, you can start to use your knife, separate that part, and then once you get here, the bird should just pop open, like so. So you've got that part, set that aside. For the wing, you can follow the shape, pop that open, that's going to expose that joint. Like so. I got to see it. I can't see in the dark now. There it is. Like so. So you got your wing there. We're going to run down this way. Separate that guy. You got your wing. You got your little drumstick there. We'll clean that guy up in a second. And then for the breast, we've got no bone under here. And I just want to show you how juicy this thing is. Gonna carve this guy up. Any questions, Colin? How long do you let the turkey roast for? Roast? Uh, rest. rest. Oh, so you can let it rest uh, at least, you know, I would say like, you know, at least a half hour. Um, and then if you're worried about like, Oh, look at that. Just look at it. You see the juices? Can you see the juices, people? It's juicy. And you got the beautiful skin and compound butter. Uh, back to the question. How long do you let a turkey rest for? I would say a minimum of 30 minutes to an hour. The beauty is if you really want to let it rest longer, you can. The, the secret, the magic to Thanksgiving is hot gravy or hot chicken stock. Uh, and if you have hot chicken stock, you can pour it over the, the meat that's carved at the table and it'll warm it up immediately. And then you won't have to worry about uh, a cold turkey being served. So look, we've got the drumstick from the wing. We've got the thigh. If you want, you can tackle, you know, getting this off the bone. I won't do it for sake of time. Um, but you got the thighs, which is my personal favorite part. You got the drumsticks, also my favorite part. And then you've got the other breast, but I've shown you how to do that with the first one. So I figured you guys can manage the rest. Can I hand that to you, Colin? Thank you, my friend. So if you want to plate this up, here's how I like to do it. I just need some space here somehow. I do it like this. I'll hand that to you. All right, so let's plate it up a little bit. So we're going to take the breast. We're going to pop that a little bit of an angle, give it some nice presentation, like so. Tidy that up. Put the wing there. Put a little drumstick there. A little wing there. A little thigh. Like so. Another drumstick, like so. Uh, and this one, <laughs> I need a bigger platter. This one's good. We're going to set this aside. But you get the idea. We're going to bring the plate over here. Give me one second. I'm going to tidy this up. Just so we're not sitting on a pool of melted butter. So, 
And then, if you wanted to hit this with gravy, you could do it now. Or I like to do just some herbs for some presentation. So grab all of the herbs, some extra herbs that you use for the compound butter, like the sage, and just tuck them in underneath like so. And this will give you a nice little garnish and decoration. And you know, however, no rhyme or reason to it. Wherever they fit, they fit. Go in with some thyme, some beautiful thyme. Like so. Some rosemary. And one of the reasons why I like doing a garnish like this is because you're kind of telling the story of what's in the turkey. Uh, if somebody's coming to the table, they're like, oh, how did you make this? Uh, well, you can tell them, you know, look at the platter. We've got some rosemary, some sage, some thyme, some parsley. Parsley here, parsley there. And that is pretty much it, folks. So, if there are no other questions, or maybe there are some other questions, I want to... I want to try something. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten all day. I'm going to try some and we're going to answer some questions for you. I need a fork. Fork? And a knife. <laughs> Someone asked, what is your favorite Traeger grill? My favorite Traeger? Well, oh. what's my favorite Traeger grill? Like model, model wise? What, the question is, what's my favorite Traeger? Honestly, they're all great. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have cooked on the Pro 780, the Timberline 1300. I've never cooked on an, on an Ironwood, so I can't say whether or not I love that one, but both are fantastic. I recommend either models, any models really. So, we got a little bit of the dark meat here. Oh my God. Mmm. That's really good. Colin, you like dark meat or, or light meat? Dark meat. Dark meat. Colin, Colin's gonna get some dark meat too. This is really good. You get a lot of that brine coming through. So it's really juicy. It's really flavorful. What's really important is the flavor of the meat, or the, sorry, the flavor of the brine goes right into the meat itself. It's not on the exterior of the bird. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to try the breast because the breast is really an important part. It's super juicy. And look at that. It's still warm. And you see, I've rested this for about about an hour now since we've been cooking. It's still warm. I haven't done anything to it. Oh, that's good. That's really, really good. Someone asked, what's your favorite Thanksgiving side dish? Favorite Thanksgiving side dish? These two. This is why I made them here today. The cauliflower is a showstopper. Everybody seems to love it. Uh, we love it here, my family. Sweet potatoes. I always want sweet potatoes. This is a fun kind of Mediterranean, Middle Eastern version of that dish. In fact, I'm going to try some now. But listen, the stuffing, everybody knows the stuffing is the best part of Thanksgiving. Stuffing and the, and the gravy. So, I don't know, stuffing sounds, counts as a side dish, right? Yeah. But sweet potatoes, turkey, cauliflower are always on my Thanksgiving menu. Any other questions? Let me chew first. <laughs> Somebody asked where you can find my cookbook. My cookbook is called the Primal Gourmet Cookbook. Um, it's available everywhere books are sold. So you can find it online. You can find it at local bookshops. Uh, you can find it at Barnes and Nobles. If you're in the States, you can find Indigo Chapters if you're in Canada. It's available everywhere books are sold. Um, and a lot of the recipes uh, are very easily adaptable to a cooking, be, to being cooked on a Traeger, which is why I really love the recipes in there. I'm biased, obviously, because I wrote them and I wrote the book. But the best part for me is cooking some of those recipes on the Traeger, like the cauliflower is from the book. That's incredible on a Traeger. Uh, there's jerk chicken that is insane on a Traeger. Uh, the roast chickens are in there. Roast short ribs are in there. It's a there. You got a lot in there that are all very, very suited to the trigger. Uh, to the trigger. 
And you've got a lot of Thanksgiving friendly recipes in that book as well that you can cook on the Traeger. So I think this pretty much sums it up, you know. I had a blast with you guys today. Obviously, we, we're cooking a lot of food. We're going to eat really well tonight. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for joining me. I want to thank Traeger for having me. Um, I want to wish everyone a very happy and healthy Thanksgiving, no matter where you are. Uh, I hope that you're celebrating it with people that you love, your family, your friends. I hope that you're able to gather this year. I know that it's been, you know, a long, long time since we've all gathered. So I hope that we're at a place where we can gather uh, and cook delicious, delicious food like smoked turkey, roasted sweet potatoes, roasted cauliflower, hang out, have a good time. And if you want any of the recipes, again, they are all available on Traeger.com slash recipes or on the Traeger Grills app. If you haven't downloaded that app already, please go ahead and do so. It is a game changer. It helps with just about everything. Uh, you've got the Wi-Fi on there. And you've got a bunch of recipes and videos that you can catalog and browse through from or browse through. And uh, what else? What else? What else? Am I missing anything? I think that's about it. If any other questions, call them. We handled everything. We did everything in record time. I don't know if it's record time. I'm kidding. All right. Well, uh, if you wanted to get my book, that's available. Again, everywhere books are sold. Uh, my name, again, is Ronnie Joseph Lebowski. You can find me on uh, social media like Instagram. And my handle is at primal underscore gourmet. Uh, my blog is cookprimalgourmet.com. All of the recipes are available there as well. And uh, yeah, happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for having me. It was a blast. Uh, I hope to see you all soon. Peace and love. I'm going to have some more turkey. <laughs>